Good morning, and welcome back to another virtual service here at SCACEM. We're excited that you can join us this morning, and as we continue our series, Continuity in the Character of God, we're excited that we can praise a God that saves. I also want to take this time to wish you all a happy Father's Day. And as we celebrate this day of fatherhood, how appropriate is it to give thanks this morning to our Heavenly Father. Let's take some time to greet each other and welcome one another in the chat room. Let's quiet our hearts as we begin our time of worship. God has extended salvation for all mankind. This morning, we want to praise him for his merciful gift of salvation, that he has made us righteous before him. Please rise with us as we begin our time of worship. Our call to worship verse comes from 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. Praise to God for a living hope. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's bow down in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning, knowing that you are what fills the empty void in us that was caused by sin. You have extended your mercy and grace through Jesus Christ for all mankind as a free gift that we can be known by you, saved and made righteous again. This morning we want to praise you for you are mighty to save and we are humbled that the God of the universe loves and cares so deeply for each and every one of us that you would send your only son to pay the penalty of our sins. Hear us as we praise you with our voices this morning, that we may not sing for the sake of just singing, but may it be a voice from our hearts full of thanksgiving. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin our time of worship, let's sing Mighty to Save. Let's sing Everyone Needs. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave As you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Say 
savior he can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave shine your light My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. God is for us, who can stand in the way of his salvation for us? For Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? As we continue our time of song and adoration for God, let us sing knowing that there is no place that the grace of God can't reach us. Out of the darkness he redeems us, and our eternal hope is in him. Let's sing, The Lord is my salvation. of God. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea. And I am safe on the solid ground. The Lord is my salvation. when darkness falls the strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun the Lord is my salvation of his word when winter 
to her face, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of need. When I am weak, I know His grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord? As we have received forgiveness from our Lord through his son, Jesus, let's come before him with a humble and contrite heart, knowing that he accepts all who comes before him. Let us lift our sins to him in prayer of confession. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you with a humble and contrite heart. You know our needs even before they reach our lips. Still, we confess and admit that we are in need of your grace and your salvation. We often forget this and take your love for granted as we live such comfortable lives. Help us to learn to lean on you and to remind us that there is a light that shines through the darkest places of our lives. Forgive us our sins, Lord, and renew our spirit. Refresh us with the living spirit of God and revitalize our faith. We lift these prayers of confession up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we are in a time of confession, let's sing, Jesus paid it all. Because Jesus Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I hear the 
the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne, I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was it white as snow. is the time for offering and this is the time we can offer not only our money to him but dedicate our resources and our time to him let's pray for the offering heavenly father above there is nothing we can do to ever repay you for what you have done for us you deserved everything that we can give you our money our possessions our time and our values Teach us to give without constraint and to serve those who are in need, both physically and spiritually. We worship you with our giving and our tithes and offerings, and we lift them up to you. In Jesus' most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Please join me as we begin our scripture reading for this morning. Today's passage comes from Romans 3, 21 to 26. The righteousness of God through faith. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, 
he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You may be seated. Now I would like to invite Nathan Rittenhouse to share God's message with us. Well, good morning, everyone. Nathan Rittenhouse here, and I trust that you've been enjoying this series. Alicia has walked us through several passages in the Old Testament, looking at the character of God, and I want to continue that theme into the New Testament today. And so the message this morning is titled, Two Testaments, One Plan, and we're looking at the continuity and the character of God between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there are several important reasons for doing that. One of them is, is that the Bible sets out to answer the question, what is God like? It starts with the assumption that there is a God. It Pretty much that's a presupposition throughout. But the question isn't whether or not there is a God. It's what is this God like? And so that question really is foundational to our understanding of, of who God is, this question of what is God really like? And a lot of the questions that we have about Christianity, about our faith, about the hope that we have, actually boil down to this question, what is God like? Now, one of the key elements and uh, underlying ideas there in that question is, does God change? And if God changes, that's a big deal because uh, it changes the way that we think about the foundation of morality. It thinks, uh, changes the way that we think about our concepts of salvation and certainly about the way that we think about um, God's promises and the fulfillment of those. So this idea of does God change and as it relates to what is God like is very important. Now, there are some fun ways in which this question has been pitched before because it does seem to some people on a casual glance that the God of the Old Testament is very different than the God in the New Testament. And in my work traveling around speaking at colleges and universities, I've heard various different ways in which this has been pitched to me. And actually, somebody in our Q&A last week asked this very question about, is there a difference between the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Perhaps two of the most fun ways that I've heard that question asked is someone once asked me if God got saved between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You kind of have this wild out of control God in the Old Testament, and then uh, something happens, and then you have Jesus as a representative of the character of God. And people would say, that seems like something big happened there. Or you have this vengeful, wrathful God, and then sort of the hippie, mellow Jesus comes along and gets God to tone it down just a little bit. Now, that perception is alive and well, and I think there are various reasons for that. And I want to walk us through uh, why I don't think that that is true and why, why there could be that presupposition or that assumption. And so in order to do that and looking at the continuity of the character of God, I want to look at some Old Testament and some New Testament passages just quickly. You don't need to look all of these up or try to keep up with them. But I want to make this point. Because oftentimes when we think of the concepts of things like love, mercy, compassion, kindness, faithfulness, forgiving, uh, we associate that with the New Testament. And when we think of judgment and judgmentalism and wrath and condemnation uh, and avenging, punishing sin, we think of that with the Old Testament. But just to flip the script here for a moment and, and point out to you that if I really do think, and I really do think this is true, that if you're reading the Old Testament and you miss out on the steadfast, loving kindness of God, you've missed something. And if you read the New Testament and you miss out on the judgment of God, you've missed something as well. So I'm, argue, I'm going to be arguing for a continuity in the character of God across both Testaments and then show how that's important for God's plan of salvation for us. So let me jump into it just by giving you a couple examples. When you think of the, the idea of love, for example, you can read in Exodus, where Exodus 15, 13, where it's written, In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. And again, in Exodus 34, verse 6, it says, And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And there's a balance there, too. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And you can do the exact same thing if you have a concordance or a way to look this up of looking at the use of the word mercy, of kindness, of the concept of faithfulness and God's uh, glorious, steadfast love and his forgiveness. Those are ideas that are all deeply embedded in God's revelation of himself in the Old Testament. 
and his actions and the way that he expresses himself to his people and to the broader world as well. There's a, a graciousness to God that he is praised for and celebrated for um, because of in the Old Testament. That's certainly there. It's certainly true. Now, what gets interesting is that in the New Testament, you have these same ideas. Um, and we should point out here that when we're looking comparatively at the amount of time spent on these different topics, that the um, Old Testament is three and a half times longer than the New Testament. So you would expect there to be a weight in that direction of some of these references. But when you look at the word judgment itself, it appears uh, 43 times in the Old Testament and 40 times in the New Testament. There's only a difference of three. And when you consider that the New Testament is uh, three and a half times shorter than the Old Testament, you actually have a higher concentration of the word judgment in the New Testament than you do in the Old, Te Old Testament. And that also applies to the word wrath and to holiness, believe it or not. So if there's a lot of mercy and love and compassion and kindness in the Old Testament, and there's a lot of forgiveness and um, or there's a lot of judgment and wrath and avenging and holiness going on in the New Testament, why is there this perception, do you think, that there's a, a change in God's character between the Old Testament and the New Testament? What's the difference there? In fact, you can have somebody like Jesus who, if you're excluding the concept of the kingdom of heaven there for a moment when he talks he actually talks about uh hell more than he talks about heaven and yet goes down in history as one of the most loving and kind-hearted and open and affirming and everybody uses jesus as the um the the character who epitomizes grace although jesus never uses the word grace in any of his teaching and so it's just kind of interesting that our perception of who God is based off of our own presuppositions that may not be biblically founded really come to light. But I'll tell you why I think that is true. And it's largely this, that in the Old Testament, in the times in which God very clearly and distinctly reveals himself, there's the command and there's the sin and the punishment is almost immediate. God says, don't touch this. They touch it and they die. There's a very little delay and part of that is, is because of a lot of the stories in which you have very high, God has the full, very, very clear revelation. Uh, you're, they're, they're wondering, what should we do? Well, God has revealed himself. He's right there in a pillar or a, a, a cloud or a fire. Um, he's making himself known in very close and intimate ways. It's not difficult to figure out what God wants you to do. And so it does seem that there's some immediacy, both to his presence and then to the judgment of the disobedience. So the speed of the judgment and the punishment as a violation of the standard, does seem to be much faster in the Old Testament. That's certainly true. So that would be one part. The speed of the judgment oftentimes is instantaneous. And that does make it seem like God is a little uh, more quick to, uh, or more wrathful or more vengeful. Now, when we start looking at um, the New Testament then, and we think about this perception of the speed of justice, it is a bit different. There's a the, there's a delay in this idea of part of God being forgiveness is that He delays judgment and punishment. In fact, in like Second Peter three eight, when they're asking, you know, why is God slow in keeping His promises? Why has He not come? And the idea that Peter is speaking about there is He says, no, God's not slow in keeping His promises, but He's waiting. He's waiting for more people to come to repentance. And so one of the key things that's different, um, not in the character of God, but in the application is as you have this unfolding revelation of his graciousness, we see that a delay of justice is necessary for the reality of forgiveness. So if God did not delay his justice, the category of forgiveness wouldn't be possible because if you were just dead immediately when you sinned, then it wouldn't really be, uh, you'd be dead. You wouldn't be here. And so God is still gracious. He is still just. He is still forgiving, but there, there's a speed difference. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So I think that's the first one. There's, there's a differentiation in the speed sometimes. Uh, the other one is, is who does the executing? Who does the condemning? Who actually is uh, establishing justice? And one of the reasons that I think we sometimes subconsciously think that the God of the Old Testament is different is that in the Old Testament, God oftentimes does ask his people to establish justice on earth. We have to remember that the Old Testament, the Jewish people are operating as a theocracy, as a God-led nation. And if you have another nation who is up to no good, stuff that God does not approve of, 
and does not enjoy and finds to be abominable, um, sacrificing children and that type of thing, God sometimes does say to Israel, look, grab your sword and sort this out. And so God uses the Jewish people to establish holiness in his land and on his earth. And so it's God using other people to accomplish his justice that adds a lot of the more, should we say, gory details to the Old Testament. Now, before we get into this idea that God, you know, has a special people and he uses them to, uh, you know, annihilate and it's ethnic cleansing or genocide or anything like that, it's very important that we remember that God is not, you know, infatuated with one group of people, but he is deeply interested in this idea of, of holiness and purity. And so, for example, when the Israelites are going into the promised land, you might remember the story in Joshua where Joshua crosses over the Jordan River into the promised land. They're about to have a lot of battles with the people there. And Joshua looks up and sees the angel of the Lord's army, and which would be pretty exciting. And he sees the angel of the Lord's army. And he, if you're going into a conflict, you would ask this question. And he says to the angel of the Lord's army, whose side are you on? You would want to know that. Are you on our side or are you on their side? Because he confronts him. He meets him head on. And it's interesting to me that the angel of the Lord's army in that moment says neither. He just says to Joshua, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. And so the conquest of Canaan and all of the warfare that happens around that is not a statement of the perfection of Israel. It's a punishment for the sin of the people who were there. And the commander of the Lord's army says he's not on either side but he's there for maintaining purity and holiness on earth. And that same thing is expressed elsewhere to the Israelites when they say, hey, don't think that God gave us success here because we're special. It's rather because of the sins of these people. And later when Israel themselves sin, they get kicked out of the land and get exiled. So God is consistent there in his treatment of humanity, but there is a, a point in time in which he is using other people to establish his justice on earth. And a lot of that did lead to a lot of conflict and violence in the Old Testament. Interesting then, as we transition in the New Testament, and I, I want to make this clear as we go, that somehow in that switch, you get from, you know, that idea of the, in the Old Testament of, I'm going to use the, the uh, Israelite armies to, to establish justice. To, let me read you a passage from Romans chapter 12, um, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, that does seem on the surface very different, like a very different set of rules to abide by. But what we have to remember here is that verse starts off by saying, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. And so what you see in the New Testament is that God is the one who does the doing as it comes to judgment and punishment and vengeance. He takes care of it. It's God's wrath. It's God's vengeance. God is the one who establishes purity, maintains holiness and order. He's the one who does it. He no longer asks his people to be the people who sort that out. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not interested in justice by any stretch of imagination, but it does mean that as a Christian, you're never called to strap on your sword and go downtown and establish holiness. OK, so what what I'm saying here is important. There isn't a change. There's a complete continuity in the character of God. But what does change is what he asks of his people in relationship to the other people. God is holy in the Old Testament. God is holy in the New Testament. God is forgiving in the Old Testament. God is forgiving in the New Testament. But the way in which he asks his people which is now expanded in the New Testament beyond just the Jewish people uh, to the people who have faith in Christ. We're going to talk about that in a minute. What he asked of us is categorically different in our response to the people around us. So now we live our lives leaving room for God to be the one who establishes justice, which I think is great because he's way bad, better at it than humans are. Um, and so that's the shift. It's the same character of God, but a difference in what he has for humans to do. So I think there's uh, a learning function there for Israel in the Old Testament. They're learning about the holiness of God. They're learning about the consequences of disobedience. And in the Old Testament, to be fair, it's not that God always uses Israel as um, his sword, as it were. He uses uh, foreign nations, and sometimes he just takes people out uh, himself as well. So God is able to do this, but he does teach and instruct Israel through that sometimes so that they would grasp an idea of what it is that he wants from them. But as the fullness 
of the revelation of his character and his plan unfolds, we see a change in what he expects of humans, but not a change in his character. So how do we make that jump then from the Old Testament to the New Testament? And for me, one of the most helpful figures in that transition is John the Baptist. And let me just read to you for a moment what John the Baptist says about Jesus, because this is really helpful, I believe. John the Baptist comes in the in the style and the type of the Old Testament prophets. He's out there in the desert. He's wearing camel hair. He's eating locusts and honey. Uh, he has the hallmarks of this exocentric uh, Old Testament prophet out there in the desert, kind of a wild man, um, but preaching fire. And the people are coming out to hear him and be baptized by him. And uh, he's really just kind of a fascinating character who's very helpful in this transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So here he comes in the style of the Old Testament prophets. And this is what he says about Jesus. An argument breaks out and some of the people who had been with John the Baptist said, hey, this other guy, Jesus, you know, some of the people who were following you are now going to follow him. What do you think about that? And John says this, or yeah, John says this in John chapter, John the Baptist says this in the book of John chapter three. And I want to read to you starting in verse 27. And this is in response to the confrontation. To this, John replied, a man can receive only what is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bride, bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine. Listen carefully here. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all and the one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God for God, gives the spirit without limit, and the father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. And so, John the Baptist is, is the transition figure. I think he's sort of the midwife who helps us in that transition from the Old Testament to the new birth and life of understanding what it is that God has in store. And so John the Baptist stands in the gap. He's representing the Old Testament prophetic tradition, and he's pointing to Jesus and saying, look, uh, I'm not worried that people are going over to him. That's what's supposed to happen. That's, that is the plan. He must increase and I must decrease. And so he's pointing to this transition that the New Testament becomes the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It doesn't stand in opposition to it, even though when Jesus says things like you have heard it said, but I say to you, he's at the same time saying, I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill it. I came to bring the fullness of what they were pointing to, to fruition. So John the Baptist gets that started. John the Baptist points, he stands in the gap and bridges that transition of saying, okay, what is the Old Testament talking about? What is God's plan? Look, actually, it's the same thing. And now I'm, I'm standing here taking this and showing you how it applies to this. And Jesus must increase. I must decrease. So that transition is happening during the lifetime of Jesus through the work of John the Baptist. Now, there's another character who explains this to us even more beautifully, I think. And that's the Apostle Paul. And here's a point. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to grab it and to flip it open to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. So John the Baptist points, the apostle Paul explains. And this is Romans 3, verse 21. And there's, there's a lot packed in here, so we'll only be able to look at just a, a few portions of this for a moment. But listen to this idea as we go through about this transition of the relationship of the two Testaments, of the Old Testament to the New Testament. So here we go. Romans 3, verse 21. But now a righteousness apart from the law, it's a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. You think, okay, there's a lot going on in that sentence. Just let me say it again and then explain to you what's going on here. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So, in the New Testament, combination of the Testaments here. In the New Testament, in this new era, in the time of Christ, what Paul is saying here is, look, there is a righteousness from God that has been made known and has been revealed to humanity. And it's apart from the law. It isn't, it isn't a righteousness that comes from the Old Testament law. It's different than that. 
but the Old Testament law points to it. And so you as a Christian, the reason that you don't live by the Old Testament is because you take the Old Testament so seriously that when the thing that the Old Testament is pointing to shows up, you believe that. It's the John the Baptist move. He must increase, I must decrease. So the validity of the Old Testament for the Christian life is what it points to. So to be a Christian is not to deny the authority of the Old Testament by any stretch of imagination. We're not saying it's a different God. We're not saying it's ridiculous rules. We're saying actually the, fu the fullness and the fulfillment of that is made known to us in Jesus. John the Baptist is pointing that direction, and Paul makes it clear here. A righteousness from God, apart from the law, that was testified to by the law and the prophets. And so the prophetic value of the Old Testament is brought to its fullness in Jesus. And so its value is in saying, this is not the way that humans are supposed to treat each other anymore. This is not necessarily the laws that God has for us. It's the whole Old Testament is pointing to something else, something else that is coming. And when it gets here, there are those who believe it and those who don't. So this righteousness from God has appeared. How does this happen? Verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Some translations have it through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Both of those work there very well. So this righteousness from God, this new righteousness that's apart from the law, that the law is pointing to, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Why? It answers that. Because there is no difference. For all have sinned. That's Jewish people and Gentiles, everybody else. Uh, Americans, Canadians, all of us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be the just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. There's a lot going on here, but the simple thing that I want you to take away from this is that what is happening in the New Testament as it, revealed, as it, as it relates to our salvation and our relationship with God is not a new system. It's not something totally different. The whole Old Testament is setting us up for and helping us understand the character of God so that when it is more fully revealed in the person of Jesus Christ, the idea of sin, the idea of righteousness, the idea of atoning sacrifice is all set up for us. And God not only is the one who gives us the definition of a justice, he's the one who establishes justice so that he might be the just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul gets so excited in this idea of talking about the faithfulness of Christ and our faith in Jesus Christ is he's saying, look, your salvation and your relationship with God has actually never been about genetics. It isn't about saying, oh, well, Abraham is my father. Um, there's value in that, but that's not what saves you. Actually, what saved Abraham was that he had confidence that God would be the one who provides the sacrifice. And this links in with what Alicia's talk on Abraham and Isaac was about, that God is the one who provides. Abraham's salvation came from his faith in God, not from his heritage, not from his gene pool. It was in his confidence that God would be able to fulfill and God would do what he had promised. And so Paul gets very excited about that, saying, look, there's an expansion that's happening here on the definition of the people of God. The scandal of God's grace is that it's far more inclusive than anybody ever thought. It actually has to do with our faith and confidence in God not being part of a special people. And so there's a righteousness that comes to us from our belief in Jesus Christ and through his faithfulness to the task that God had for him that is independent of what you read in Leviticus. However, what we see, you know, even clear back in Deuteronomy is this foretelling of the fullness of what it is that God is going to do. Uh, a, a lamb is promised to complete the sacrifice, and then John the Baptist says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world when he points to Jesus. And so you can see this transition and and of the, the continuity of the plan, the continuity of the character there, uh, even from the sacrifice, or the almost sacrifice of Isaac with Abram, God providing the lamb, and it comes to its fullness in the person of Jesus and saves a whole lot more than just Isaac. So John the Baptist points, stands in the gap, helps with the transition. The apostle Paul gets delighted to explain that this is what's going on. And actually, Paul makes his argument quoting from the Old Testament. It's not like Paul was running around with a copy of the Gospel of Mark in his back pocket. No, Paul is using Old Testament scriptures. He's reasoning from the scriptures with him, saying, look, the whole Old Testament 
points to this. This is not a new thing. This is the 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 death and resurrection of Jesus is the greatest I told you so ever uh, in in history. This this should not have been a surprise to anybody, and that's why Paul gets so energized about it because it's the same plan. It's the same God who's working this out. So how then does that happen? If there's if there are two testaments and there's one plan and there's one of you, how do you fit into that? How does Jesus saves? So if we say John the Baptist points, Paul explains and Jesus saves, what does that actually mean? We started off by saying we don't want to get into an argument about saying, well, the Old Testament is about justice and the New Testament is about mercy because that's not faithful to any of the stories there or even to the way that the words are used. So how then are you going to balance out mercy and justice? And this is one of the great philosophical problems of any religious belief system is is that question how do you balance mercy and justice and this is a great conversation starter if you want to have a religious conversation with somebody sometime how do you balance mercy and justice and here are the problems if you have a religion that trends toward mercy it bad people get away with bad stuff um sin goes unpunished it seems a little too soft and flimsy when we get down to the reality of evil in the world so if we lean toward mercy, it gets a little sloppy. However, if we lean toward a system that's focused mostly on justice, then the world seems cold and clinical and sterile and um, abrasive in some sense. And then there's a world without forgiveness and only justice. Ah, that doesn't sit right with us either. And so we're left with this difficulty of the mercy and the judgment. And, and the quick fix is to say, well, one's Old Testament, one's New Testament. The, the more beautiful way to look at it is to say it's the same across both, but they are brought together in the person of Jesus. And John Stott was the one who very helpfully pointed this out, that one of the unique features of the cross of Christ is that it is a point, the only point in history in which justice and mercy function together and through each other. So let me say that again. Justice and mercy are not in opposition at the cross of Christ. They exist with each other and through each other. And it's this. God is holy. There, the wages of sin is death. That's just a consequence. If God is the giver of life and he has established a way of life and you do something that deviates from that, it leads to death. So the wages of sin is death. Going against the grain of God's life-giving abundance leads to death. And so God demands justice. And justice happens in the crucifixion. At the same time, so there's justice there, at the same time, God demands justice, but he also provides the sacrifice. And so it's the justice of God that there's a sacrifice, but it's the mercy of God that God himself is the one who provides the sacrifice. And so mercy and justice aren't operating in tension with each other. God provides and fulfills both of them at the exact same time. So is there punishment for evil? Absolutely. Is there mercy and forgiveness? Absolutely. And and it's only as Christians that we can say that without speaking out of both sides of our mouths because of what God has done through Jesus. The whole thing then, as it's set up there, is there's a continuity of the character of God. There's a continuity of the plan from Genesis to Revelation that God has laid out. And there's an invitation for us to be part of it. The way that you can derail that the fastest is to decide that, okay, uh, I will work my, or, or have some crazy idea that this is a works-based salvation, if I can be good enough to impress God. And the, the ultimate problem here, as you have to grapple with this, as everybody does, is the problem of perfection. And so if there's one plan across the Old Testament and the New Testament, here's the problem. The problem is this. There's, there's a perfect God way up here. Can't reach my arm that high. There's a perfect God who in his holiness is, is complete and self-satisfactory. He doesn't need you. He's perfect. Then there's Nathan and you, and we're all down here somewhere. You can't even see how low. I mean, the, the differentiation in the perfection of God and the perfection of humanity uh, is hilarious. I mean, it's, I mean, hilarious in the sense that it's, you can't really grasp that difference. We're totally different, totally separated. And so the problem is, how does that which is perfect come into relationship with that which is imperfect and still maintain its definition of perfection? And a lot of religions of the world teach that, okay, here's the perfect God, here's Nathan, and I'm just going to build this, you know, 16-point checklist, and I'll do this and 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 this, and finally God will look over at me and say, hey, Nathan, you're perfect. 
great beard. Come on over. We're buddies. And we work our way into a position of being acceptable before God. That didn't happen in the Old Testament, and it doesn't happen in the New Testament. In fact, that idea that we could somehow pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and just do the right thing and then reach a level of perfection that would make us worthy of relationship with God from a Christian perspective and a, even an Old Testament perspective of the holiness of God is just laughable. We know that that can't happen. And so the only way that that is possible is if that which is perfect does something to perfect the imperfect. It only works if God is the one who does something to us to make us acceptable in his sight. We can't get ourselves there. And so that's the message of the cross. And that has been the plan all along is that God is the one who provides. Abraham going up the mountain knew this. God is the one who provides. Moses standing before the Red Sea knew God is the one who provides. Uh, the people in the desert, God is the one who provides. The Jewish people as a minority going into a new country and up against a lot of opposition, God is the one who provides. The Jewish people in exile being um, banished from their homes, God is the one who it's, God is the one who provides. That's the story. That's the plan. But it becomes clear when Abraham was going up the mountain, he didn't know that there was a lamb going to show up. A lot of the Old Testament prophets, they knew that God was going to do something, but they didn't know how it was going to happen until John the Baptist said, look, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Same God, same character, same holiness, same perfection, same mercy, same forgiveness, but now as Christians with the New Testament, we just get to see how it is that God did that. And he did it by Christ. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. It's a different kind of thing. You're a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. So Christ takes on the consequences of our sin and attributes to us his righteousness and we don't get to feel special about that. We just get to say, thank you, God. You are the one who provides. There's one plan from the beginning that God had, and that was to reconcile people to himself. The Old Testament speaks about it, and the New Testament clarifies how it is that God does that. And we have the opportunity to either rebel against that and say, no, God, I think I'll do it my own way. Or we take cheap shots at God and say, I don't like you because of some passage that I read out of context in the Old Testament. Or we can say, you know what, Lord, I recognize that you're the one who does it. You're the one who provides. And I'm going to thank you for that and receive that as a gift to you. You're the one, this new righteousness that comes from God. I want to receive that. I want to place my confidence in Christ. I know that he is the one who can save me. And so when we submit ourselves to him uh, as an act of gratitude, then obedience naturally flows from that. So was there a lot of things that the people in the Old Testament had to do? Absolutely. Are there a lot of things that the people in the New Testament need to do? Absolutely. But we don't do it to impress God or to make ourselves holy. We do it out of a reaction to this idea that God is the one who provides. And I can live a life of graciousness because God will take care of me. God provides for my salvation, and God also provides the needs that I have for now. That's what Jesus said. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. The pagans worry about these things, the flowers of the field, the birds of the air. God takes care of them. And so what we do now as Christians, having accepted our salvation as a gift to us from God, is we get to live extravagant lives of sharing that blessing and that goodness and that good news with everybody all around. In the Old Testament, God's intent was to bless Israel so that the nations would look at them and see his goodness. Same God, but the, the game has shifted. The Holy Spirit has come and now he sends his people out into the world to go and tell. And so we transition from a come and see model of the goodness of God to the go and tell model of the goodness of God. Same God, just it's a different missional paradigm in this time. And so I hope that helps you. It's really helpful for me to see that transition of John the Baptist. He points, makes the transition for us. Paul explains how they fit together, how they, and Jesus does too, how they fulfill. So John the Baptist points, the apostle Paul explains, and Jesus saves. And that's worth celebrating. So I hope you can catch uh, a glimpse there. There's much more to say on every single level and category of that. Maybe some of that will come up in the Q&A here in a little bit. But I think the proper thing that when we read scripture and we look at these issues, we say, thank you, Lord, for your uh, abounding faithfulness and your steadfast love to me. Amen. Thank you, Nathan, for sharing God's message with us. Let us respond to the word of God by affirming the faith we believe. Let us join our voices with the saints and say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who has conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please rise with us as we sing our song of response. Let's stand. You stood before creation. Eternity in your hand You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand You stood before my failure and carry the cross for my shame My sin weighed upon your shoulders My soul now to stand So what could I say? And what could I do? But offer this heart, O oh God, completely to you. So I'll walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me. And what could I 
do But offer this heart, oh God Completely to you Please remain standing as we sing the doxology and then we will receive the benediction. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Good morning, SCAC Church family. It's great to be with you this morning, even though it's virtually. But I just want to uh, say thank you. Thank you for extending the hand of friendship to me while I've been on home assignment. It's been awesome to just get to know so many more of you within your fellowship. I want to say thank you for your missions committee for inviting me to join them and to share my heart with them. I want to also say thank you for, to being invited in to share and be prayed for in one of your Wednesday prayer night gatherings. Thank you. This to me is the body of Christ in action. And uh, it's so awesome to be together uh, on mission together you see when it came to the beginning of march i wasn't quite sure how or when i would get back to the field because i didn't have a visa and we had no idea uh, how i could obtain the covid vaccine because i was still too young at that time for the requirements to get that covid shot but god god came through and he opened a door for me to be able to get my first COVID shot. And uh, it was shortly after that, that we started looking into different visas. The type of visa that I was to go back on was no longer being uh, extended to people offshore. But God, God brought someone along that showed us and told me how we could get another kind of visa to get me back in country. So we thought that the visa would come first, but how could Lisa get that second vaccine shot? Because you see, I was given a date of July 28th to get that second shot. But God, God is still working the miraculous. And God brought a servant named Tommy from your church to come alongside me, to cheer for me and cheer for many other international workers actually. And I was actually able to get that second vaccination shot just before the long weekend. And we still were waiting for my visa to come through. But God, he, again, he did the miraculous. And I received my visa just this past Monday. And so now I am getting prepared to leave. We have booked flights and I will be leaving Canada on June 17th, just a couple short weeks away. And I just want to say how thankful I am to be able to connect with you. And now we have these virtual platforms. So I look forward to connecting with you, continuing to connect with you virtually through email or whatever way that we can see fit. I would ask that you pray for me because when I land, I will have to go into a five day mandatory quarantine. Uh, there has been rumors that that, 14 day, that five day quarantine could become 14 days. But God, God is already showing me that he can do much more than we could ever hope for or imagine. So we are trusting that the five day quarantine will remain and I will be able to leave and continue on to my new location. 
So I just want to say thank you. Thank you, church. Thank you, friends, for being a part of what God is doing in Southeast Asia. I couldn't go there without people like you supporting me from here. We are on mission together. Thank you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you today. You are the God of miracles. We are witnesses of how you are good to your people, how you provide for us, and how you show up when we see no way forward. Thank you for letting us get to know Lisa. Thank you for your faithful timing in this arrangement for her, that she can return to the field on schedule and serve you overseas. Father, we pray for her during her quarantine at this time. We pray you smooth out the process and help her get to her destination refreshed and ready to serve you. We also ask that you protect Lisa in Jesus' name. Protect her from the pandemic and keep her well as she readjusts to the new environment. Bring unity in the spirit amongst her team and sensitivity to your guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we conclude our service this morning, let's receive the Lord's benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Hello and thank you for joining our worship service this morning. We hope you had a meaningful time. Before we conclude our service, there are a few announcements we'd like to share with you. Firstly, I'd like to welcome those who are joining us for the first or the first few times. We as SCACEM are committed to seeing lives transformed as we encounter Jesus together. And so our first announcement is that we are having a live Q&A session after this service at 11 a.m. For the whole month of June, we've asked our two wonderful guest speakers, Alicia Wood and Nathan Rittenhouse, to join us at 11 a.m. to answer your questions. And so if you have questions, you can ask them in the Google form we provided, either in uh, the online church platform or on Zoom, or you can even find it on YouTube. If you have questions you'd like to ask, uh, they are willing to answer them. Or if you just want to watch and listen along, you can find that information again on YouTube or if you're on the online church platform or on Zoom, those links will be provided to you. If you want to get to know more about our congregation and our events and our community life, you can find out more on our website, scac.org en. Right now we're in a bit of transition time, so uh, to get to our website from there, you'll want to click on the top right corner where it says congregation and then you're gonna to wanna to click on English Ministry. There you'll be able to find out all of our information, including our email address if you'd like to get into contact with us. Our next announcement is Alpha Youth. Running on Fridays starting in July to August at 8 p.m., uh, we are going to be running Alpha Youth, which is uh, a program which seeks to introduce the basics of the Christian faith through a series of talks and discussions in small group setting. Now, okay, you rolling? Okay. We're gonna scare Jason with this spider. Come on, we're gonna get him back. Watch it. Guys, this is a film set. You got it. Oh, gosh. Spider! Tons of things happen in our lives every day. And in a 24 hour period, we ask ourselves so many different questions. Like, what should I eat? What should I wear? Or who should I hang out with? Sometimes we ask bigger questions. Like, what do I wanna be when I grow up? Who will I marry? Or where will I live? But every once in a while, we ask ourselves those even bigger questions. Questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? And is there more to life than this? The reality is, there aren't a lot of places we can go to explore life's biggest questions. So on Alpha, we want to create a space where we can talk about those kind of questions in a way that's open and honest. In each one of our hearts, it's like we have a happiness bucket that we're constantly trying to fill. It can sound like this. If I just had uh, more money or nicer clothes or a new girlfriend, then I'd be happy. The nights would come and the girls would be gone. Like, they'd be just me, you know, me and I guess God, right? And I'm like, okay, there's definitely more to life than this. Like, I just want, I want, I want, I want, and you don't get anything. There's this deeper, even spiritual hunger that we're all trying to satisfy. As someone who grew up in an atheistic home, I wasn't just going to accept what he was going to say. So I was like, okay, 
did this actually happen historically? What's the evidence? I'm not gonna just buy into something because I get swept up in the emotion of it. You have approximately 570,000 hours left to live. And we wanna invite you to spend less than 24 of them with us on Alpha. Setting. Now this Alpha program is gonna be targeted towards youth. So those people who are uh, grade seven to grade 12, if you're interested in joining or having, or you have more questions that you'd like to discuss, uh, you can co contact Jeremy or you can email us at our, web, uh, at our email address, which will be on the website if you're interested. Our last announcement for today is that we have a missions moment. Remember to keep it in your prayers. Thank you for joining us this morning. We hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you.